evening, everybody. Welcome to the University of Houston. It's a really miserable, cold, wet night, so I'm pleased to see as many of you show up that, uh, that have. This is the final topic in our series, uh, Energy Symposium series, uh, Critical Issues in Energy. Titled today is Renewable Energy. Is there a need for government support? Uh, I'm Dan Wells. I'm the Dean of the College of Natural Science and Mathematics. I'm going to be your host tonight. We've sort of had a, I, I think, a pretty amazing series. Uh, it's, it's been very, press, uh, very impressive, very provocative, very informative, and I hope everybody out there feels the same way. Before we go on, I would like to uh, acknowledge our media sponsors, uh, Houston Business Journal. Uh, we thank them, as well as Houston Public Media, um, for broadening the awareness of this event. We're very indebted to them. Um, so. After, we're going to have some short presentations by the panelists up here, and afterwards we're going to have a question and answer period. So there should be cards on the, on, that you sat on, hopefully you didn't sit on them, um, and you can write questions on for, and these questions, you know, just list your name and, you know, who you want the question to be addressed to, if there's a specific person you want to be addressed to, uh, and maybe a little bit about whether you're student, faculty, staff, industry, alumni, and uh, Ramana and Krishnamurti, my partner in crime over here, will be collecting those things. And after sort of some of the initial comments, uh, we'll have a question and answer period uh, to address some of the panelists and some of the questions that you have. Um, so to get tonight's event started, I'd like to introduce our moderator tonight, Dr. Joseph Pratt. Dr. Pratt is the NEH Cullen Professor of History and Business at the University of Houston and the director of the UH Energy Sustainability Minor. He is a leading historian on the oil and gas industry, uh, especially as it relates to the Houston area. He's a, a very old friend of mine. I'm very glad to have him as, as moderator tonight. So please welcome me in, in uh, welcoming Joseph Pratt. My primary role is to get you to the speakers, and my primary role is to get the speakers to the questions. So we'd like to leave as much time as we can for your questions. You'll have a chance to write them down, as Dan said, and we'll try to have some discussion across uh, three or four different perspectives here. I want to do this for, uh, as a part of the whole, the fourth of the fourth of four of these sessions. I want to acknowledge the U of H students who have been coming to these. Would you stand up? Student at U of H, current student, yes. Um, they don't come out as many on cold nights. They're, they study on cold nights, I think. <clears throat> I want to start uh, asking you to look at the questions. It is renewable energy, need for governmental support. I want to point to three things that we will end up talking about no matter what we think we're doing tonight, and three different uh, perspectives on this issue that you want to keep in mind as you listen to the speakers. Um, Summarize them as, uh, what do we mean by support? Uh, it's a big, broad word. It's not subsidy, it's not loan, it's support. Um, the second big question is, why, why renewable energy is, sing is singled out and should it be? And the third is a broader question of what is the proper role of government in a democratic capitalist society, more specifically in the U.S. democratic uh, version of democratic capitalism. So let's look at those just very briefly and get to the speakers. The first uh, comes down to what can we do? What is support? What have we done in the past and what can we do? And that road goes on forever. I started listing things that I knew of as a historian of energy, and the list gets so long you can't possibly think we could even sit and read it and point to each one. But let's look at some, some big examples, three or four, that illustrate what we have done as support for energy through time. The first, uh, easiest, direct grants or loans. When you think of direct grants or loans, what do you think of? Solyndra, it's in our political culture forever, or to all the old people die off who were uh, interested in that election. Um, it is a long tradition in America, and it's direct grants or loans to things that the government and usually the citizens uh, want to grow and need to grow. A second category is tax credits. When you think of when, which we will tonight, uh, when you think of when, you think of a production tax credit, uh, using the tax code to support a renewable energy farm as we have in the United States now for years. Uh, when you think of taxes, you also talk about whatever you would call tax breaks, and 
There is an ongoing uh, discussion every time this subject's broached about what about the subsidies for oil historically. And those have traditionally been oil breaks or, or price, tax breaks or tax, shall we say, cuts in preference for oil um, over time. Um, a big issue tonight and with any form of this question, because electricity is at the heart of a lot of our energy use and is one place where we have fuel competition, is how do these kind of support system subsidies apply to electricity? And there you look at things like renewable portfolio standards, where states and the federal governments uh, will require that by a certain year, a certain percentage of electricity will be generated by renewable fuels. You also talk about feed-in tariffs, where government policy uh, encourages expensive, re expensive renewable energy to be blended with less expensive uh, traditional electricity so that the price leap isn't so high and people get accustomed to the new source over again a long period of time. And finally, we do think uh, finally about less direct support. I think the most important of those historically has been support with research and development. Uh, quite often, government business co-sponsored, but almost every energy farm that we have has been the beneficiary of this kind of support. Uh, so government R&D has helped almost every energy farm that has grown large to grow large. And finally, what we don't normally think about, although we should every time we fill it with gasoline, uh, infrastructure support. The, the classic example in our nation was a highway trust fund, the highway gas taxes, state and then federal, that have been used historically to build our incredible freeway system, our road system, and more recently to build mass transit such as Houston Light Rail. So that's, uh, all those are support. If we talked about those specifically all night, we would ask the question every time, why are we doing this? How are we doing it? How long will we do it? How much will we spend? And what will we get for this? And that would be a, a discussion that we could have 50 times tonight on 50 different subsidies. So let's look also at the, at the kind of a middle level of, of, of focus on fuels, and this is a much shorter point. Why do we target renewables for support in the debate? Think about it. If this was the 1970s, we would say we would target renewables because we're running out of oil. Even the CEO of Exxon thinks we're running out of oil in the 1970s. And we would say we need alternatives, particularly domestic alternatives, to imported oil. But we're not in the 70s. If you're alive in two th today in 2014, everywhere you look is an astonishing oil and gas revolution in this country that has changed our idea of what, how much oil and gas we have left. What we are concerned about in the year 2014 is the impact of sustained use of fossil fuels on climate change. And if we, we might as well acknowledge that up front, most of your views on whether you think yes or no to this question and what kind of support will sooner or later reflect your own view on the severity of climate change and what should be done about it. And finally, the, the one that I've studied all my life, the proper role of government in a democratic capitalist society. One thing that you find when you study this at all is there is an inherent and normal tension between the logic of economic theory as applied to these issues and the logic of practical politics. And that, I assume, is something that will be represented on the panel. There are things that theory tells us that we should do after certain assumptions are always made. There are things that politics in a democracy tell us that we can and can't do. And that's a hard set of questions. I would like to acknowledge them just before we get to the speakers. Government in this country has always promoted different kinds of businesses, different kinds of interest uh, industry because governments, one government function is prosperity, job creation, economic growth. Whether we should apply that to renewable energies in our lifetime is the heart of the matter here, and that's where we'll start. So I'm going to introduce each speaker, and then when that speech is over, the second and then the third. Um, do you all have this? You don't want to hear me read. I'm a horrible reader. So I'm gonna, I am. I, the first time I read in public, my big brother was in the audience for the first time in my life in an academic. The first thing I did was hit my tooth on the mic uh, out of the old shamrock hill and wake up about 100 people who never then listened the rest of the time. Did he really do that? And I'm sitting there holding my tooth trying to figure out what, why I was reading instead of just talking, which I have learned to do. So I'm going to tell you two or three things about each speaker that is useful for tonight. And I'm going to ask you to read the detailed biography that you have here in a, in a nicely printed brochure. Congressman Green. A graduate from Jefferson Davis High School, and he has a business degree from the University of Houston. Those are important things to us here at the University of Houston. He has been in uh, state government for about 20 years, and then in 1992, he uh, was elected uh, to the U.S. House of Representatives, um, where he has stayed and has uh, 
drawn into very important and useful for all of us committee assignments. Uh, so this is the 29th district. Am I remembering the number correctly, Congressman? Uh, it's uh, most of East Houston inside of Beltway 8, roughly from 288 in the south to 45 north. So it's a, it's a heart of Houston, with a, with, as with every district in the world now, with a big chunk carved out in all kind of uh, efforts to uh, affect who gets elected where. So he is on the uh, energy uh, committee in Congress, or uh, let me get the, you can read it and get the exact title, but uh, a long time since 1996. And he's in an in a interesting, in, in both in energy and environmental issues, where he has substantial uh, clout uh, with seniority and with long uh, service. He's an interesting position of a Democrat from Houston on oil in particular. It's a funny position. It puts you in the middle, and that's one reason I think it would be a very good uh, uh, panelist tonight, a, a person who's in the middle on these issues and has a long experience trying to sort them out in, with the logic of practical politics. So, Congressman Green. First of all, thank you for inviting me. It's great to be back on campus. And um, the, um, my wife and I are both proud graduates of the University of Houston. And uh, she got a real job. Um, she was a math algebra teacher for 26 years. And uh, I was a business major and enjoyed running a business, but then politics got, got in the way and um, we never know where our careers may be. I also came back to law school and, and got enough hours in the 70s to, to take the bar and pass the bar in 97, so I also attribute that to my uh, education here at the University of Houston. Um, I'm proud to be a, a Houston alumnus. In fact, uh, University of Houston is a predominant four-year school for our district that goes from the border of Intercontinental Airport, like I said, down 45, uh, close to downtown, and then around the Beltway 8 to East End. Uh, I actually have Hobby Airport in our district down to Beltway 8 on the far south side. Uh, our district traditionally includes all the refineries and chemical plants along the Houston Ship Channel. Of course, our lines change. The numbers stay the same, but our lines change in Texas every three or four years, it seemed like, between the legislature and the courts. So, but I've always represented, even as state senator, most of East Harris County. So that's why I work with our energy industry a lot. Uh, well, we have at least five uh, refineries in East Harris County and more than 20 chemical plants that, uh, that employ a, a lot of folks in our district. Um, it's our, our job base and our tax base. So, but I serve on the Energy and Commerce Committee and the Energy and Power Subcommittee, and also on the Environment and Economy Subcommittee of the Energy and Commerce Committee. And I am a Democrat who works on oil and gas, but I also support renewables. Um, the wind power, Texas uh, actually produces more wind power than the rest of the country combined. And that was because the legislature in Texas a few years ago made the commitment, and I'm hoping somewhere along the line we'll do the same thing with solar. But I'd like to talk about tonight some of the um, developments that we're seeing. And, you know, if you live in the Houston area, you see it literally in our backyard. Um, currently, we're going through such a, uh, a huge increase in production in natural gas and, and even liquids, uh, oil and natural gas and liquids. Um, the combination of hydrofracking and horizontal drilling uh, made our, the U.S. the top oil producer in 2015, uh, producer by 2015, and uh, that's according to the Energy and Information Agency of our Department of Energy. And it's no secret, in Texas, we've actually fracked for almost 60 years. Now, it didn't develop up until fairly recently when a number of companies did it, uh, but Texas accounts for about 35% of the nation's oil production and has 23% of our nation's gas reserves. The oil and natural gas industry accounts for 2.1 million direct jobs and millions of indirect jobs. I also represent a great deal of the Port of Houston and is number one in the nation in energy exports. Those refineries and chemical plants make products that, we're, uh, that we export. In fact, just uh, or late last year, Department of Commerce gave the Port of Houston award, being the, uh, award for being the number one export port in the country. And when you think about that, we compare it to New York, uh, Newark, LA Long Beach in that. Um, the refining and chemical industry, um, and we're seeing the expansion of almost every plant in that area in retooling in East Harris County. And nationwide, we're seeing it also, but in Texas, it's more pronounced, I think. Energy production includes encourage uh, uh, and to be responsible on considering the needs and the input of all key stakeholders. 
Um, I also support expanding our LNG exports. Uh, we have the Department of Energy has a process that we're uh, approving exports. It's part of an 05 energy bill that our committee uh, put together, although back then we thought we were going to import LNG. Uh, but now we've reversed it. And uh, that's a lot of jobs for engineering students because uh, it, uh, uh, Chenier has got the first permit on the Sabine side of the, uh, on the Louisiana side of Sabine River. But, uh, and they were building an import terminal, but then they had to uh, spend another couple billion dollars to, to export that uh, product. And they'll probably be the first one, one in Brazoria County. There's a number of them been announced over the last uh, um, year or so. so. But I also support wind and solar. Um, in fact, when we, Congress, we used to be able to get earmarks, uh, the Department of Engineering, in fact, the, the part of the university campus that's in our district is the old Slumberjay facility. And uh, that's where a lot of the wind research and engineering uh, is done. So um, I wanted to make sure that uh, I want Texas to be the energy capital of the world, not just oil and gas capital of the world. I want it to be, I want it to be wind, I want it to be solar. And I would say I, I also support expansion of our nuclear power. The problem is, is that uh, long as uh, natural gas is so reasonably priced, it's, it's hard to expand it, although we are expanding in the southeastern United States, uh, nuclear power. The uh, Texas wind power uh, will improve our electric liability, reduce carbon intensive electricity fuels, and lower electricity prices for consumers. In fact, just recently, a few weeks ago, when we had one of our cold spells, it was reported that we would have had a brownout without the wind uh, energy uh, that was generated uh, because, uh, because frankly, when that, that north wind was coming through, it made those windmills work a lot harder. These technologies are becoming increasingly affordable, and in President Obama's 2014 budget included $33.6 billion in new energy tax incentives between 2014 and 2023, including a permanent extension of the Renewable Energy Production Tax Credit. That's the one that uh, uh, that has generated a lot of our success in, in wind power. Although, I have to admit, under the current uh, situation in Congress, that, that uh, we haven't extended that tax credit by law, and, uh, and we'll see how we do it. But what we are doing is expanding some of the benefits that oil and gas has had on the tax side. Uh, oil and gas has typically used master uh, limited partnerships, MLPs, for the, uh, and now we're going to expand them to include renewable projects in wind and solar. Senator Coons from Delaware actually has introduced that legislation, and the bill will give investors in renewable energy projects the same access to our corporate structure and tax structure. My neighbor, Congressman Ted Poe, actually has introduced it on the House side. Of course, we don't pass little energy uh, tax bills. It'll end up being combined in something over the period of over the years, but hopefully, and both bills have bipartisan support in the House and Senate. And uh, hopefully we'll, uh, with the completion of the new competitive renewable energy zone transmission project, we'll finally see Texas Panhandle wind generated electricity reach our urban centers, Dallas, Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, Houston, Galveston, and, and obviously Rio Grande Valley. Energy efficiency is something that's important because I think it's a, it's a resource we can also benefit from, from conserving that resource. And I think that's a part of government, which has been part of our tax structure for years on, on, um, on energy efficiency. In fact, there's legislation that's been in the Senate and in the House committee, in our House committee, to expand um, Energy Star program the Department of Energy has, and a new called Tenant Star program, which will provide commercial buildings and tenants and landlords flexibility to increase energy efficiency projects, including federal uh, government buildings. Decreasing our energy usage would benefit all sectors of our economy, but also our environment. A uh, gallon of fuel or a megawatt saved through these efforts is another one we don't have to create through the attritional methods. And I'll close by saying I'm also a, an oil and gas Democrat, but also deal, think we need to deal with carbon. Um, like I said, I went to uh, business school and law school. We don't deal in absolutes. But when the huge percentage of scientists say we have a problem, I think we need to address it. Um, the EPA is doing it now. Uh, I would rather it be a congressional decision. Uh, Congress passed, Lisa House did a cap and trade bill back in 2009, didn't move anywhere in the Senate. There's things we can do without doing a cap and trade 
that will make sure we get a handle on our, our carbon emissions. And that's jo Congress's job to do that. But with that, I look forward to the comments and questions. Thank you. Second speaker is Jimmy Glotfelty again, if you'll look for the extended uh, bio. A graduate of TCU with a BS in political science and marketing. He's a very career of 15 years in public and private sectors. He has gained considerable expertise in electric generation, electric transmission distribution, energy policy, energy security. Uh, he has, was a key energy advisor to then Governor, uh, Governor George W. Bush and then became a part of the uh, presidential administration of President Bush as a key advisor to the Secretary of Energy. He's a founder and currently ex executive vice president of Clean Line Energy Partners, a very interesting company which uh, has numerous uh, big projects in building transmission lines needed for wind power, uh, more in the Midwest than Texas. Um, so he will spend uh, much of his remarks talking about wind, which is a very good case study of the need for subsidies or not, support or not for wind power as a, as a leading renewable power. So with that, we'll give you Jimmy Glotfeld. Thank you all for having me. I think uh, I was initially going to become a moderator here, but um, um, I think this uh, promotion. <laughs> I got a promotion to uh, to move up to be a uh, to be sitting at the uh, grown ups table. So uh, thank you all. Um, I'm, I'm love being uh, in the room with one of my heroes, Paul Chu. Um, we go back to uh, the Governor Bush days and um, I uh, he taught me superconductivity, of course, the policies of superconductivity, not the physics. Um, and uh, I got to work with him when I, I was at the Department of Energy as well. So I love, love seeing him here. He's a, uh, truly a, a gem uh, for the University of Houston. Um, two other parts of my, uh, my introduction. Um, first of all, today, um, this has nothing to do with energy, um, but today is the opening of the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. So all you students, you need to get out there. It's great. We raise like $12 million a year for students and scholarships. Um, and then finally, my opening that I say a lot lately is uh, I'm a Republican and I like wind energy. And I'm going to go through some slides to tell you why. So first of all, I'm going to tell you just the 30-second uh, advertisement for my company, Clean Line Energy Partners. Um, we started about four years ago. This uh, purple area in the country, in the center of the country, is the highest capacity factor wind. Um, so what we're trying to do is build these lines. There are three transmission lines going to the east and one of them going to the west to move this very high capacity factor, low cost renewable energy to the, to the load centers to the, uh, to the east and to the west. It's very hard when you're going across multiple states. Uh, we have to go through 11 states and get permits from 11 different states, which is very different from pipelines where if you're building an interstate natural gas pipeline, you just go to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission and get a permit. So uh, it's expensive and it takes a long time to do. Uh, and we're four years into it and we think uh, we'll be successful here in about uh, 18 to 24 more months. But um, what this has done is this has given us a, a really good understanding of the wind resource here, how the production tax credit um, affects the wind resource, um, where the production tax credit is necessary and where it may not and ultimately where it, when and where it may end and how it may end. The, my perspective uh, is a little different from a lot of Republicans. Um, I think the production tax credit is uh, a pro-business and a market-driven type policy. Uh, the government for many decades has used tax policy as a means to incent or disincent different types of actions, whether they be personal actions or, or corporate actions. And the production tax credit uh, is, is no different. Uh, it is incenting the use of renewable energy uh, through a tax credit. Um, the benefits of that is it's driving down the cost of electricity, it's creating jobs, and it's improving the environment. Um, I either get a really hard time for putting this quote up here, um, or people just don't care, but uh, a Republican here in Texas, Karl Rove, who you may or may not know, uh, worked with President Bush, um, and maybe this is appropriate being primary day here in the state. 
Um, but, uh, you know, he, he was one of the few that came out and said that the production tax credit is a market me mechanism. And it's primarily because you don't get it unless you produce. So um, we, we continually try to show that um, and, uh, as, as a fact that, that this isn't just a Republican or a Democrat issue. Both sides of the aisle um, support uh, production tax credits. So what is the PTC and who gets it? The production tax credit uh, is a 2.2 cent tax credit um, for every kilowatt produced um, from a wind turbine. But does wind, are they the only ones who get this? The answer is no. There is a currently a production tax credit for wind, solar, nuclear, and clean coal. These three facilities that you see on this page, the Ivanpah uh, Solar Facility, the Vogel Nuclear Plant, and the Edwardsport integrated gas combined cycle plant um, are all beneficiaries of the production tax credit for their own uh, types of resources. So um, most people in Washington uh, and in lots of research institutions, they'll call out and say that uh, we've got to kill the PTC for wind. It's distorting the market. But there is never a discussion about the production tax credit for these other resources as well. I believe that uh, that, that is one that uh, should be on the table. The production tax credit for wind uh, is expired as of today. Uh, it, there's a grandfathered provision which allows those projects that are in construction and operate by the end of 2014 uh, to receive that credit. Um, solar expires in 2016, and nuclear and clean coal expire when the market allows them to create 6,000 megawatts of new uh, resources. So there's a long way to go for nuclear and clean coal um, solar and wind um, will have to be renewed at some point in time. This policy has not been, uh, while it's been great for consumers and, and uh, new technologies in the wind business, it has been a very big challenge for the industry to deal with. Um, what this chart shows is, uh, you can see these, these pink lines, um, this shows what happens when the PTC expires. It's expired four times already, and that is, uh, you build generation, and then it expires. And what happens the next year? Nothing. And then, it gets ex and then it gets renewed, and the industry builds more, and then it expires. And then the same thing happens over and over again. Here in 2005, they had a multi-year process, or, or a few bills that went past um, that allowed it not to lapse. And what's happened in these years um, is efficiencies have gotten so much greater. The cost of wind energy has come down dramatically. New technologies, and most of all, new factories and new jobs have come onshore into the United States to help reduce the cost and reduce the supply chain. So as a, as a tax policy to incent and to increase the use of renewable energy and decrease the cost of renewable, renewable energy, it has been working. If it was stable, it probably could have gone away a long time ago. Congressman Green knows, uh, knows why it's, um, uh, it hasn't been uh, approved for a long period of time, and that's just because of money. Um, uh, it's, it's called an expiring tax provision, and they're very expensive. There are about 100 of them. They'll be on the plate, uh, I think, the congressional calendar at the end of the year, perhaps. Um, but everything they do is expensive. So this has to fit into the budgetary restrictions of, uh, of, uh, of our country. So it, too, um, uh, it, it's uncertain going forward. So what are some of the, uh, the reasons um, or, or exhibits as to how wind technology has gotten cheaper and how the PTC um, has benefited the industry? Um, this just shows one piece of that, and that is uh, we used to have short towers uh, and small blades, and uh, we, it seems very, you know, remedial, but... Uh, we are going to, uh, to taller towers and longer blades, and that means a bigger sweep. And when you have a bigger sweep, you can convert more kinetic energy uh, into electricity. Um, this is a process. Uh, it doesn't, it's not a GE or a Siemens or a Vestas that just builds a new turbine and sticks it out there. There are lots of issues that go into new technologies there. Um, and primarily, it's the warranties that these companies have to manage and ensure that they can warranty their products in different wind speeds at different wind heights. Um, so 
Stability of the tax policy, stability of the production tax credit is really important for that. Um, and, and as I said, has benefited. We're, we're going to be moving to 100 meter towers um, here probably within the next three or four years. Um, the capacity factors in some of these areas um, are approaching 60 percent, um, which is a, uh, an amazing um, a capacity factor for a wind turbine. This is a, uh, a pretty wild slide, but uh, this is intended to show um, our costs coming down, and the answer is yes. Um, these are all purchase power agreements. Um, these are ones that are executed and signed. Um, going back from 1996 to 2013. And these are different areas of the country indicated by different colors. Um, purple is the wind, is the kind of the wind belt. Um, I think green is the west. Uh, they're the pr where prices are highest. That's California. Um, but what this shows is we had an increase in gas prices. Uh, we had an, a run on turbines. You might ask Boone Pickens. That was part of his dilemma right in here. Um, but generally speaking, wind prices are coming down, uh, and that's a good thing. That is what the PTC is intended to do, is drive the price of wind down through technology. Um, so ultimately, the production tax credit can go away. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that that's the best policy, um, but I think it's, a, uh, uh, it's definitely a possibility going forward uh, that it will not uh, be around forever. Um, but this is, what we're, this is what we're aiming for, uh, low cost uh, renewable energy. Uh, this $20 a megawatt hour is with the production tax credit, so that would really be $42 a megawatt hour. Um, you know, it's pretty hard to find a natural gas plant uh, with 5 or $6 gas that can produce it at $42 a megawatt hour. So um, we are getting, with the PTC, very close to that tipping point where uh, it eventually could go away. Uh, just two, uh, two slides here. Is it good for the consumer? Uh, the only person we can listen to for that or the only folks that we can listen to that and listen to for that, in my opinion, are the utilities. Uh, here's XL Energy and uh, AEP. Uh, both of them say that it's going to save their consumers millions of dollars a year. We've heard that from these utilities. We've heard it from utilities in the southeast. We've heard it from utilities in Texas. Um, it is saving consumers money. And that's a net positive for the American consumer. Uh, are we creating jobs? Um, this will show uh, blue are wind facilities, red are uh, our manufacturing facilities and part of the supply chain. Uh, this supply chain um, is fantastic. Uh, this didn't all start supplying the wind business. This was supplying the automotive business. This was supplying the oil and gas business. This was supplying uh, different types of polymers and different types of oils and different types of epoxy resins and different fiberglass products uh, that go into the automotive business. Or uh, All of these companies are now in the supply chain for the wind business and they've created thousands and thousands of jobs. All of these jobs become in jeopardy as, th that are specifically tied to the wind business become in jeopardy as you have this cycle of the production tax credit. So. Uh, it's not just a wind company that goes away. It's a lot of jobs that could go, could, could go away as well. Just a few more slides here. But uh, wind energy improves the environment. If we're getting the production tax credit, it's reducing the cost of energy. Uh, it's displacing a gas or a coal plant. Not very often does it displace a nuclear plant. Uh, what are you doing? You're, you're eliminating the emission profile of those that you're displacing. Uh, so uh, you, get, uh, you get benefits of all of these different types of uh, pollutants that are decreasing the more uh, I increase you have in wind penetration in the U.S. Here's, uh, here's Robert's issue, but density. Um, density doesn't work for me uh, in, the, in the PTC and the wind world. It makes perfect sense uh, when you're dealing with uh, solid fuels, but... Uh, what we are dealing with here is the cost of electricity. How do we reduce the cost of electricity? Not the density of the electricity, the cost of it on a per kilowatt hour basis. And what we are doing is pushing that down through technology. So you'll hear about why the PTC is uneconomic and why we're spending too much money on a, on a, on not a very dense type of 
of uh, uh, technology or, or energy resource. Uh, but the price is the key. We have a certain amount of demand, and we have to satisfy with that with a certain amount of electrons. Uh, and if the cost is right, density should not matter. This issue is, uh, so how do you compare the PTC um, and wind with, with other resources? This is a chart that's put together by Lazard, a big investment bank. Bank. It's called the Levelized Cost of Energy. Um, basically, this line right here shows um, what the cost would be of wind. Um, that's in the, I uh, can't even read it from here, but in the $40 range. Um, I think you'll see it lower than that. Um, but what you have here is uh, the, uh, this coal price, um, 86 to 145 is with Powder River Basin Coal at $1.99 an MMBTU. Prices have gone up dramatically. This is a natural gas plant at 450 gas. We're above 450 gas today, so this is, this is old. These prices are going to go up and down, and they're going to fluctuate. And with wind, what you have is a capital cost and an O&M cost and no fuel cost. So as a part of the resource mix, it's a very good component and a part of the resource mix because it doesn't have these variable costs. I think I have two more slides. So the PTC pays for itself. Um, this is a very Republican Reagan economics kind of uh, policy. Uh, when you incent economic activity, what do you do? You, you create more economic activity. Um, so this was a study that Next Era, the largest wind generator in the United States, did. Uh, there are utility in, in Florida as well. Uh, but basically, the extension of a production tax credit uh, is a net beneficiary to both to the federal government and state and local governments. Uh, this was not extrapolated to include, uh, you know, every uh, the economic benefits of the hotel and the office supply store and all of that. This is just major direct uh, salaries and benefits. So, um, this is a good policy that works. It incents new uh, economic activity and it pays for itself. Negative prices, uh, we can get into this, but uh, some people say negative prices are bad because they, uh, so if you have, uh, if your cost of energy is uh, zero and you get a production tax credit, you basically can bid a negative price without losing any money. This is a big argument that uh, a big uh, utility up in the, uh, in Illinois has, has talked about. We can get into this if it's a discussion item, but um, it's a little complex, so I'll, I'll pass on it. But if you want to get into negative prices, I'm, I'm happy to get in with that. Uh, and, and here, uh, one of my heroes, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, he talks about uh, uh, getting in the game. We can't just sit on the sidelines. This is to the students. Get in the game, um, either through research or get in the game and try to help build resources that are sustainable that will help benefit our workers and our country going forward. I hope I've given you all a little bit of understanding of the PTC. Uh, I'm not an expert on solar, so that's why I focus primarily on the, on the wind side. But I'd be happy to answer any questions when the time is right uh, on solar or wind production tax credits. Thank you all very much. <clears throat> Final speaker will have a quite different view. It's Rob Bradley, MA from Economics at the University of Houston, PhD from International University in Political Economy. He's the founder and CEO of the Institute for Energy Research uh, and an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute. Uh, Rob has written a number of uh, well-researched volumes on energy markets in the U.S. and government's role. Uh, he is a specialist particularly on natural gas. Uh, he is completing work on a, the third and last volume of a trilogy uh, on political capitalism and energy, which he says was inspired by the fall of Enron, where he worked during the fall, um, and it collapsed on him as well as many other Houstonians. Okay, he is an economist by training and a historian by nature, and we've known each other a long time because I'm the opposite, um, perhaps. Um, I'm going to talk to you tonight about long-term changes in the energy mix of the United States from a historical perspective uh, to put this issue in a broader context. We're going to try to encourage him to stay within a 20-minute time limit so that we will have questions.
Well, first of all, thank you uh, very much for uh, having me. Uh, it's great to be back on the campus. I got a master's in economics here. I know a number of the um, uh, professors, and Joe Pratt certainly is a mentor. And also, this series is really uh, important. Uh, there's something I, I call power of opposites learning. Uh, in areas of disputed open knowledge, um, if uh, you see both sides, rather than trying to get a sort of a sanitized middle, you really appreciate uh, the issues. Uh, here are some of the books I've written, probably not as many as Joe Pratt, but uh, I'm trying, Joe. Um, U.S. Renewable Energy. Uh, I'm, I am going to bring into play a, a, an alternative worldview to argue that we should let the market decide uh, between uh, energy sources. Uh, there should be a separation of uh, government and energy. And certainly, with the $17 trillion plus debt that we have and the almost trillion dollar a year additions to the debt, each one of you students here, you owe about $55,000 and it's going up. I'm going to argue that it's a uh, fairly easy and logical choice with budget cutting to clean out the tax code for all the different energies, to uh, severely restrict the, uh, uh, the budget of the Department of Energy. I think you can even argue that the department can be eliminated with some of its functions uh, going other, over to other departments. And in particular, and this is where I think uh, uh, critics from right and left can come together, we've got to end cronyism. Business, government, relations. Now, um, I can go over uh, the history of uh, the rise of the U modern U.S. wind power industry to show you that uh, it has uh, just about everything to do with the production tax credit, which is now 22 years old, uh, 1992 and state mandates. Uh, there's some 30 states that have mandates. The toughest mandate is here in Texas. My old company, Enron, was responsible in the 1999 electricity law getting that provision for Enron Wind Company. At the same time, uh, Enron bought a struggling wind company called Zond. It's uh, the other big wind company in the U.S., Kinetech, was going bankrupt. So Enron really rescued the wind industry for the United States and legislatively. But uh, it's pretty much a straight uh, political play. A lot of times in an industry, you might have certain firms that, are, uh, uh, that get special government favor. But uh, this is really a whole industry that the, uh, the wind industry will disappear uh, or it will stop growing if the production tax credit is ended, if they stop getting things like uh, double declining depreciation, and if uh, renewable mandates are uh, expired or allowed to expire. If you look at the subsidies, uh, um, the Congressional Budget Office will show you on a dollar uh, uh, basis how renewable energy and energy efficiency gets uh, the lion's share not so much for oil and gas, and a lot of these oil and gas subsidies uh, should go with uh, renewable subsidies. But if you look at this on a per kilowatt hour uh, BTU basis, then it really becomes pronounced where uh, qualifying solar is uh, not getting one or two times more the subsidies of, a, of uh, oil and gas, but uh, you know maybe 10 times or more. The production tax credit, you look at uh, that uh, for wind developers, that's about the equivalent of a dollar a gallon for gasoline if ExxonMobil was to have a production tax credit. It's a, it's a big number, and that's just the start of the subsidies. Uh, uh, transmission lines that get wind from nowhere to somewhere, this is another cost because where the wind really blows, people aren't around. And in places like the Northeast where people all are around, there's a civil war going on in, within the environmental movement where the grassroots environmentalists are saying, hey, Sierra Club in Washington, what, you know, what's going on? Um, all of the above energy uh, policy we hear a lot about. Uh, and I think this is something that we need to reject, not only with energy policy, but in all areas of our life. Because it, uh, with 
with economics, it's about scarce means to unlimited ends. We have to make hard choices. Uh, it's a central planner's dream. It's an open sesame for uh, government waste. Uh, you know, we'll substitute a little, little for everyone. Come on in. Uh, cronyism. I think this is a, a, a uniting uh, political argument for right and left. We have got to start by cleaning out uh, all the subsidies uh, between uh, business and government because surely uh, human needs are going to be important as we um, try to address the uh, deficit. Um, Joe uh, is, talks about teachable moments, and I agree. And I think that a worldview is required, a different worldview, to really understand energy reality of renewables versus what I call the dense fuels. I begin with a cartoon from the New Yorker uh, some years ago, one caveman to the other. Something's just not right. Our air is clean, our water is pure, we get plenty of exercise, everything we eat is organic and free range, yet nobody lives past 30. And the thing you could add to this is our energy is renewable. For most of mankind's history, the market share of renewable energy was 100 percent, uh, primarily burning woody matter, also falling water, using wind in different ways, and some uh, rudimentary solar applications. And it was with carbon-based energy that a, a fundamental transformation occurred. Now, um, I read these books so you don't have to. Here's a book uh, from the, uh, what, 1838? Is that what it says? Uh, where the author uh, talks about wind power. And he says uh, it's great because it's free, but guess what? The disadvantages of wind are its uncertainty, both in quantity and in time, and the difficulty with which it is regulated. Uh, and this is before electricity. With electricity, you can't have intermittency. And there's not wind power that's really supplying any uh, room like this in the whole United States. And as a matter of fact, I think we need to stop using the term wind power. I think we need to use the term wind gas power because that's what it is. It's wind gas. It's not, it's not just wind. We hear that somehow wind is new. It's a wave of the future. Actually, wind power is a very, very old uh, industry. Uh, there was a, a wind turbine up in the Northeast that's profiled by Scientific American back in uh, the late 19th century producing electricity. This is just eight, nine years after the company we know now as General Electric was uh, uh, founded. Uh, so they've been working on this uh, for a long time. Here's a micro wind application from the 20s uh, where you can use a traditional uh, wind mill you know, on the farm and get a little electricity from it. These are very old technologies. And the reason that wind, or we went away from 100% renewables to the dense energies of uh, coal, oil, and gas was explained in a, uh, a, a, a classic book written in 1865. This was the birth of energy and mineral economics, the first book to uh, look at uh, energy sustainability questions and to look at energy minerals as something different. And uh, Jevons was quite clear on the limits of wind power. He said the first great requisite of motive power is that it shall be wholly at our command to be ex exerted when and where and in what degree we desire. The wind, for instance, as a direct motive power is wholly inapplicable to a system of machine labor for during a calm season, the whole business of the country would be thrown out of gear. He also talked about if you want to replace uh, the energy density of coal uh, with uh, wind, you'd have to have windmills covering the whole island of England. You just, uh, energy density matters. It's a, it's a physical concept. And one way to look at it, Joe, do you have a piece of coal on you? You don't have it? Okay. I, I got one. I got one from, this is from Christmas. <laughs> and uh, it's wrapped up. It's a little dirty. But I think maybe the best way to think about it is that this is the sun's work over millions of years, okay? And what solar wind and falling water is is a very dilute energy flow coming down. 
why is wind power, for example, so expensive when the cost of wind is zero? Steel, concrete, land, transmission, you need all this infrastructure to try to do what nature needs to do. Ooh, it's falling apart on me. And guess what? You don't need storage with this. It has its own storage. That's part of energy density. Last time I'm, last time I'm gonna use that, but maybe next Christmas. Um, Jevons uh, looked at the other renewables, hydropower. It's great when uh, you have a good water year, a lot of snowpack, a lot of uh, flow, but what happens when you have a, a dry year? California's electricity crisis back in 2000, uh, part of that was they had a bad hydro year. What happens for an industrial society if uh, you don't have a good hydro year, or the wind isn't blowing, or the sun isn't shining on a moment-to-moment -moment basis? And Jevons looked at biomass too. The, uh, uh, really, think of wood as baby coal. It's the sun's work over a very finite number of years. Um, but you need a lot of biomass to uh, substitute for oil, gas, and coal. And to grow all this uh, is tr takes tremendous land uh, uh, commitment. And uh, geothermal rare, too. We always hear that, you know, renewables are the, uh, the wave of the future. Back in the Jimmy Carter era, 20% of our needs by 2000. And solar means solar, wind, hydro. And here's another uh, headline from the same paper. A uh, quarter century later, renewable fuels may provide 25% of U.S. energy by 2025. And we're giving, uh, uh, you know, decades of subsidies. Why isn't it happening? And it, and it really all gets back to uh, energy density. The hyperbole, uh, the World Watch Institute, all back in the mid-'80s, although wind farms still depend on tax credits, they are likely to be economical without the support within a few years. Same thing a decade later, uh, same thing, it just goes on and on. Same thing with solar. The solar market could explode. Now, solar is important. There's a free market niche for solar off the grid, but when you can plug something in, solar is radically uneconomic and it's also intermittent. In other words, you've got to firm it up with a, uh, a, a hydrocarbon supply to get it on an apples to apples basis. Uh, the quotes uh, from 1990, uh, you know, we're almost economically competitive. Um, and you still uh, hear it today, oh gosh, by 2025, it's gonna be competitive. Uh, back at Enron, there were a lot of tricks going on, but uh, we, we made the front page of the New York Times back in 1994 saying that we could, we had a 20 year contract for solar power at 5.5 cents a kilowatt hour. Well, I couldn't believe the number then, and even today, it's just uh, way uh, below what solar can do. And I always would ask uh, Bob Kelly here, Bob, how do you do it? And there were so many subsidies that the Clinton administration said no. And uh, there were rumors going around that they had a gas turbine with it. You know, there's funny things are, uh, go on here. Now, Jim Hansen, I'm gonna uh, turn to the climate change debate. He's the father of uh, climate alarmism here in the United States, and he's doing some excellent analysis, uh, and he came out with a paper just a couple of weeks ago. Um, um, the, uh, the second quote is what he said a couple of weeks ago, but for some years now, he's been saying that renewables are really a fantasy as far as getting the quantities of energy that you need, and that if you really want to address climate change, you have really one choice, and that is nuclear power, and on a very, very high scale. Uh, so intellectually, on the left, there's realism creeping in that renewables are very expensive and they've reached their limit uh, uh, regarding what taxpayers and ratepayers will pay and that uh, they're really not a solution to uh, climate change. Anti-wind uh, power grassroots group, there are literally hundreds uh, of them in the United States and in England. There's a big backlash going on. Would you like to live near a wind turbine? What do you think it would do to your property values? This is why wind turbines are sited where people aren't. The problem is you have to build these transmission lines to get it from nowhere to somewhere. It adds to the cost. 
A book coming out by Robert Bryce on energy density. Uh, Bryce uh, got mugged by energy reality. He was a lefty, had solar panels on his roof. He's changed his mind. Uh, smaller, faster, lighter, denser, cheaper. This is what fossil fuels are about. Uh, this comes from one of the anti-wind environmental groups with John Muir, uh, be angry. That's an interesting question. Uh, a quote from uh, Lee Raymond, who I'm a big fan of, and I think Joe Pratt is too, where he was asked, well, come on, why aren't you uh, looking into wind and solar? And Raymond says, you know, uh, Raymond was uh, an engineer, an energy realist. He understood energy density well. He said, uh, look, you can, ha uh, 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 you can have a lot of growth with wind and solar, but it it's tiny. It'll always be tiny. I'm interested in the 99%. And this is really energy for the masses. Um, some quick arguments why I think environmentalists, some are, but more environmentalists should be against wind. First of all, uh, it's just energy inefficiency, where wind uh, uh, farms have capacity factors around a third versus uh, fossil fuel nuclear plants that can uh, be producing uh, really all the time. A cloudy day, a still day, or you're, you don't have a lot of water, uh, these things really uh, make the infrastructure of renewables inefficient. Steel, concrete, land, infrastructure intensive. We talked about that. We, uh, sprawl is supposed to be a big environmental issue. Renewables are energy sprawl, okay? Would you rather have a 500 megawatt gas-fired power plant uh, 10 miles outside of a city? Or would you want to have uh, hundreds of turbines uh, way out, a machine in every pristine? Um, there are environmental issues with wind power, particularly out in California with Golden Eagles. Uh, and it was a, a Sierra Club a representative who coined the term Cuisinarts of the Air. It's a big issue uh, out in California. Uh, cronyism, corporate welfare, greenwashing. You know, when I saw what Enron did with its wind subsidiary and its solar subsidiary, um, it's not good. It makes capitalism look bad. And as uh, James Hansen would say, it's a fairy tale solution uh, to climate change. Um, there is an, a, a government study from the, uh, or from the National Academy of Sciences on what uh, actual wind power has uh, done to the United States CO2 emissions, and the answer is tiny. The reduction in CO2 emissions associated with the PTC, ITC is small, amounting to 0.3% of CO2 emissions from the energy sector in the reference scenario. Um, I'm going to uh, try to speed up here because I'm down to my last uh, minutes. But uh, there's a whole uh, narrative against the fossil fuel industry, peak oil, we're running out of oil, we thought we saw the depletion signal, and that's, that's been falsified in, in, uh, uh, here in the last five, ten years. We're running into oil and gas, we're not running out of it. Uh, there's a, the feeling that fossil fuel pollution is getting worse. The statistics are actually just the opposite. Our air quality today is two-thirds better than it was in the 70s, 80s, despite uh, massively uh, increased oil, gas, and coal use. Uh, the, the, uh, the global warming issue, weather extremes, um, uh, I'll talk about that here in a minute, but the, the view is oil and gas uh, and coal is unsustainable, and I would suggest it's just uh, the opposite. Um, on the global warming issue, back in 2009, when we had a decade of the pause in Science Magazine, the global warmer writer um, Robert Kerr interviewed the scientists that said, okay, uh, the pause is about to be replaced by a jolt, uh, and this was almost five years ago. We now have some 10 reasons why we're not seeing the greenhouse gas signal the way we thought we were. And I think what scientists are realizing that is in the 1990s, natural variability actually increased temperatures, and that since then, uh, natural variability has worked against the greenhouse gas signal. But when you average over these periods, uh, uh, I, I think the right answer is in the middle, and there's a word I'd like you to consider adding to your vocabulary, and that is global lukewarming. 
I've often uh, seen, I see myself as a global lukewarmer. Um, Robert Mendelson, the leading climate economist, actually says at the lower sensitivity estimates, there's a positive externality and not a negative externality from carbon dioxide emissions. And the IPCC's latest report, they reduced uh, uh, the lower band of the expected warming range to 1.5 C degrees in, uh, with an equilibrium doubling of CO2. Um, and um, at these low levels, uh, he and a number of economists have looked at all the implications on recreation, agriculture, and they see more positives uh, than negatives. Uh, and who are the winning and losing countries? The, um, uh, the, uh, basically, the, most of the countries that are losing here, not only are they in hotter regions, but they're poor, which suggests that free market capitalism can create the wealth to help adaptation. Uh, there's a whole uh, argument uh, for reconsidering climate alarmism reconsidered. This is a book I wrote, a booklet I wrote 10 years ago. I think uh, the arguments have held out well and I have some extra copies if someone is uh, interested. I think we need to challenge on the global warming issue the key assumptions that somehow natural climate is optimal, that climate is fragile, and anthropogenic equals bad. Um, so, Energy sustainability threats, uh, we've gone through depletion, pollution, uh, climate change, but the number one threat to energy sustainability, or to sustainability to me, is, is policies in the name of fighting global warming that make energy more expensive and less affordable, rather than global warming itself. I'm going to conclude with a quote that is a completely new view on how to look at energy sustainability and fossil fuels from Peter Huber. The greenest fuels are the ones that contain the most energy per pound of material than must be mined, trucked, pumped, piped, and burnt. Extracting comparable amounts of energy from the surface, think of renewables, would entail truly monstrous environmental disruption. The greenest possible strategy is to mine and to bury, to fly into tunnel, to search high and low where the life mostly isn't and so to leave the edge, the space in the middle, living in green. I think we need to rethink energy sustainability, uh, and I think that now is an opportune time, and for you students, you are going through a lot of change. We thought we saw the depletion signal, it's, it's gone. The greenhouse gas signal uh, is, 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 is grown more faint. And uh, I think the textbooks need to be revised a little bit on this. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you. If you have questions that you can fill out and pass up, uh, Robert and I some. Let me ask this question as a Houston audience. We're all at the big, we're all at the adult table now, not the little kid table. Uh, simple question, yes or no, raise your hand to, to answer. Um, I always like this question in Houston audiences. Um, does the, threat, does the threat posed by climate change justify government support for renewable energy? Yes. All right, no. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so I'm going to, as the questions get collected, I'm going to ask the first question, and I'm going to take yours, and this is a short question, but I am a supporter of the production tax credit, and I'm also a, uh, I like the way it's written. I like that natural gas isn't in it. Economics and politics is about choice. Natural gas doesn't need our help right now. Natural gas is doing quite well on its own. But I want to ask a question that comes to mind as a taxpayer, um, particularly with the, um, the, two, the first two speakers. Uh, what is the political process by which such subsidies go away? I think we all know that, and we know from history that it's a hard process. How does it go away? How does it fade away? How do we know when we don't need it anymore, and then can we get rid of it? It's basically political will with the production tax credit. Uh, started in 92 and over the years, depending on who served in Congress, um, it would drop off. And it's dropped off again, although you see from the slides, the production was so much higher in the last couple of years than it was even in the 90s. So uh, typically we authorize uh, certain things for four or five years. There was a long-term authorization for the production tax credit. Uh, but at one time, it was only for one or two years to see if they could get started. 
And uh, so that's why, the, and right now the political will is not there to uh, extend the production tax credit, particularly on the House side. I, I, it is a political football, no doubt about it. I think that uh, it is an issue that um, the Congress will not just take up uh, the production tax credit. It will be part of what is called an extenders package, which has you know about 100 expiring tax provisions. And the way they go away is when the Congress gets the political will uh, and the votes to, uh, to completely revise the tax code. Uh, it hasn't been done in, in decades. Um, it, uh, it has to be done, uh, but that's going to be give and take from both sides. If the production tax credit goes away, I guarantee you some of the, the oil and gas provisions will go away as well. So uh, be careful what you ask for uh, in the oil and gas space because it, uh, uh, it will affect uh, every one of the energy industries going forward. All right. I have a, a question that is very interesting to me, the long-term view of if we removed all the subsidies, would there be a level playing field among the fuels? The question is, do you think the, the wind energy efficiency of 30 percent versus oil and gas at 95 percent would stay that low if the same research and, and science resources used for oil and gas industry were used for wind energy industries, although we're far from such? Essentially, is there such a historical embedded advantage to oil and gas it's very difficult for any new energy to compete with it? I think the, the capacity factors, the efficiency of wind turbines is not 30 percent in this day and age. It may have been a decade ago, but it is not 30 percent now. As you go to bigger turbines, higher wind speeds, that's where you get higher capacity factors and higher efficiency. So uh, 30 percent, uh, you don't see that very often. Um, I think that's minimizing the successes of GE and Siemens and Vestas uh, in how they are trying to drive down the price of, uh, of electricity through wind uh, and the new technologies they're putting on their turbines. Right. And I think the general question of, of um, on Eustonian's mind, perhaps, do we need subsidies in, in view of the extreme uh, supplies of, of natural gas we have now for many of the renewables that before the shale revolution seemed uh, crucial to our future? I still think we do because, as you know, the oil and gas business is feast or famine. Um, those of you who are here in the 70s, we had a great economy. Uh, during the 80s, Louisiana, Texas, and Oklahoma were actually in, in a recession or depression compared to the rest of the country. Uh, now we're doing very well. Uh, when you have production states like North Dakota or Texas or even parts of Pennsylvania seeing job creation based on their extracting of natural gas. Uh, and, but let me address one thing. I don't think there's any sole source of electricity generation you can have. I was in Norway a number of years ago, and Norway produces a huge amount of natural gas. I asked them, I said, how come, uh, what's your percentage of your electricity production? Something like 92% of their electricity production for hydro. Norway has a lot of streams, and in Texas we don't, so we have to have something else other than water. And that's why in the West you have that problem. If they have bad water years, their electricity uh, prices go up because they have to have other sources. So I think we have to have multiple sources of generating electricity, and a lot of it's based on your location. And whether you're in Norway or Washington State, you have hydro. If you're in Texas, uh, you know, wind power works, solar will work. Every drop of hot water in Israel is produced by solar, and I think we could do that. And of course, it's not as cheap as natural gas, but, um, but it's also an alternative that can fit in our energy package. A question for Rob Bradley, how can we include the external cost of air pollution in a free market approach to energy and environment? Well, with uh, traditional pollutants, um, the criteria of pollutants, I think you can argue that the cost has been internalized. We've had a lot of regulation over uh, recent decades, at least from 1970 on the federal side, even before with state side. Our air and water is a lot better now than it was several decades ago. It's continuing to get better, uh, and it's been internalized uh, by the market. And uh, oil, gas, and coal have proven that under stricter and stricter emission standards that given reasonable amount of time for the new technologies to come on, it can be done. So. Really, uh, the fossil fuel industry is sustainable. Now, when you go to something that some people call a pollutant, 
carbon dioxide, which I do, is not a pollutant, uh, then that's a, a totally uh, uh, a different source. And there's no, there's no answer there. Now, let, let me, uh, the, uh, earlier we talked about the production tax credit, and uh, uh, it was, there was some mention about uh, negative pricing. Some people are arguing that wind is CO2 positive because of this reason. That negative pricing is ruining the economics of nuclear plants. Exelon is saying that they're going to have to retire nuclear capacity uh, prematurely because the economics are so bad. So wind producers that are getting such a big tax credit, which is a good third to a half of the wholesale price in different parts of the country, this is ruining the economics for gas, nuclear, traditional generation where you're not getting capacity to come on. And if the environmentalists are, are doing a better job of retiring nuclear and hydro than they are adding wind and solar, then this whole debate over global warming is CO2 positive. It's an unintended consequence. Yeah, uh, I brought up negative prices. Uh, I'm glad it came up. Uh, in my mind, it's a red herring. Um, Nobody complained about negative prices um, when they started, which was in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, when they have high hydro years, they always bid negative prices into the California market. And Exelon wasn't complaining then, and nor was, was Exelon complaining in the first eight years of the competitive market with high gas prices when they were printing money from their nuclear plants. But all of a sudden, what happens is there are some market forces and their nuclear plants are not as valuable. They can't print as much money. Um, and what happens is uh, a negative price is a price signal that says that there's too much energy, there's not enough transmission, and there's not enough demand. If Exelon could figure out a way to build transmission outside of their service territory, negative prices would go away. By the way, if they are saying that negative prices are the reason for shutting down their nuclear plants, negative prices in western PJM or Illinois happen 1% of the time. So there must be some other management problems, O&M problems, or other problems with their three nuclear plants that they've mentioned of shutting down. Because it's just not negative prices. That's just not the answer. It, it is, the, it is uh, the scare tactic. Well, the other thing is that negative prices are discouraging new generation from coming on. If you, if you want to build a gas plant and you go to the bank and you want to have some price certainty that you're going to get a certain uh, price and you're competing against uh, uh, subsidized wind where they get such a big tax credit that they will pay you for taking their wind in order to get the credit, that ruins the economics. And now in Texas we're debating having a special uh, surcharge on consumers in order to allow long-term contracts with this new capacity. Government intervention creates unintended consequences, and this is an example. Negative prices in ERCOT and most of the re these regions do not set the clearing price for energy. These are bids into the market so that they know that the market can accept their, their energy because they don't want to turn off. A nuclear plant, guess what? They could bid negative prices too. Also, these wind turbines, they could bid zero and guess what would change in the generation stack? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. The same resources would come on. Um, I think in this day and age, when you have intermittent resources, you need flexible resources that go with them. This market for electricity will reward flexibility. Quick start natural gas plants, peaker plants, uh, inexpensive storage facilities, those are things that this type of market that we are going toward uh, will value. They will not value old coal or nuclear plants that, uh, that have to run at one speed for a long period of time. Let me ask a question that is very um, interesting to me, and it's a student question, uh, of a man who's been in uh, U.S. politics for, what, 42 years? Um, and worked hard at it and has you know, done his best to, to do what he thinks is best. Um, I find it, the older I get, the more concerned I get with our students. I call it unearned cynicism, who uh, people who haven't been in the political world of democracy very long, but assume that government can't do anything. And that's not my experience, but it's, I think with a lot of younger people it is. 
The question uh, from one of our students, with much of recent energy policy not being as effective, enforceable, and taking too much time to promote, what steps can government take to have effective policy? And that, I think, is a, is a question on a lot of minds. What can we do to make choices in government that we all can live with? Well, not all, but that we can live with. Democracy is inherently inefficient. <laughs> uh, and compare us to China. You know, if the party in China decides they're going to expand wind power, they do it. If you don't want to, you don't have that choice. <laughs> in our country, democracy is inherently in a, um, in a, you know, just slow. And for us to get it, and in Congress in the last <laughs> two years to three years has been really glacier. But uh, uh, because we've seen the whipsaw between a Democratic president and Republican Congress. And uh, so, but governments also uh, can be part of the solution. Uh, that's why I say our energy source, our electricity source, my concern as elected official, when you turn on that light, I want it to be come on. And most folks don't care whether it's a coal plant, a natural gas plant, or wind, or solar. But what we need to do is have a mix, because we can have wind and solar that is more carbon friendly. And, uh, but we'll also need something, sometimes the sun doesn't shine and the wind doesn't blow, so you need those natural gas plants. You could have, you know, coal plants that, although we're still working on clean coal technology, and I, I, where I come from, I'm not a big coal person, although Texas does generate a lot of electricity from bringing in powder basin coal to our plants here, but also in Texas, my friends in the Northeast tell me we burn dirt. We call it lignite. You have to build the plant over the, because you can't move it, so you burn it from Central Texas over to East Texas. So, uh, but it's, again, energy production, electricity production is what are your local resources? Well, and that's what we're doing. My question for uh, any politician is, look at the federal budget deficit, uh, what exists now and what we're adding to it. Business as usual, all of the above, and what are we gonna do about cronyism? Government and business really, per, in my view, perverting democracy. I think there needs to be a whole uh, new approach to the way we look at energy in politics. Well, you know, you can say that about all problems we have with government, not just the energy. You know, if somebody has a brother-in-law or whatever, but, uh, but that's not the solution to say, oh, we need to, have, sure, we, we need to have more uh, uh, public information. In fact, probably our worst thing was the Supreme Court allowing anybody to donate literally millions and millions of dollars without, uh, without knowing who it comes from. I don't care whether you're liberal or conservative. You know, for a de real democracy to work, you need to know, uh, of course, I basically believe uh, one person, one vote. Dollars don't vote, but people vote. And so that's one of our problems, our current system. And, uh, but again, we're not perfect and we never will be because democracies are not designed to be efficient. Well, we're designed to have everyone be involved or everyone who wants to be involved. Uh, last question is a pile of questions that expand to what we've talked about as support, and it's a common theme. Uh, there's about five of them here in front of me. What's your opinion of a carbon tax as a way to la level price differential as opposed to uh, direct subsidies to the renewables? Uh, being on the committee for a good while and voting for cap and trade, even though I had a lot of amendments to it because I, I didn't think that worked, it hadn't done very well in Europe. Uh, Actually, the CEO of Exxon back in 2009 said, just put a tax on it. As a business, we will deal with it. But the will in Congress is not to do that. So I don't think you'll ever see a carbon tax. So, but that's probably the most efficient way to do it, and they'll build it into their cost structure. So, but, uh, but I just don't think it's going to happen. I, I agree with the congressman. Um, I think is if you go and, and talk to utilities as they're going through their resource planning process, they are including carbon prices today yeah. when, they, when they run their models. So um, while the Congress can't seem to get the, the muster to, to, to uh, decide this, the industry is way past them. Uh, the industry is way past them on the sustainability side. Uh, they do sustainable things that save them money. Um, and, you know, renewable is one of them. Uh, if you look at Walmart, uh, you look at, there's an article that I said, saw today about Ikea. They have 85% uh, of their stores have solar panels, and, and it's saving them money every year on their electricity bill. 
Uh, those are good things. No, no. We need innovation, right. and these new policies are creating innovation. Uh, the, car the carbon tax is so radioactive uh, that Obama won't get in front of it. Uh, economists cannot justify cost-benefit analysis for a carbon tax except by doing one thing, perfect knowledge. Um, the, the idea of pricing carbon to have almost no effect on carbon emissions is, to me, a, a road to nowhere. All right, so I think we're going to end with that, and that's what we started with. A lot of this issue comes down to the, the depth of belief about the dangers of climate change. A lot of it also comes down to your own personal opinion on what government should and shouldn't do, and a lot of it on our practical experience of what we do for a living. So these are not easy questions, and I think the I want to I want to thank the people who put did a whole lot of work for these four sessions. I think they've been a great departure for our university. As we say, we want to become an energy university to have these kind of things that our students and our alums and our faculty can come to. And I also want to remind you that the the, the first three, which were all worth being here if you weren't here, are on video now. Um, help me with the website UH Energy. Just just. If you just go to UH Energy and follow the links, you'll find them. Um, and this one will be up as soon as we, uh, spring break is intervening, as soon as we get it edited and put up. I thank you for coming on a, on a harsh night. I hope you've learned something. More, more, I hope you've thought about your own views of this. These are important things. And as citizens, we need to make them important and think about different viewpoints, as I think we tried to do tonight. So thank the speakers. We have a presentation. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think this has been a, a great discussion. I think it's, this, is, this is what academia and what we are all about at the university, to have you know, honest, open disagreements about you know, how we believe and what we think and be able to discuss them in an open and intelligent way. This is, this is exactly what we wanted. Thank you all for coming.